Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Patricia Kong. Um, I'll be your host today from scrum.org. I am really pleased to have my friend Richard Kasparowski speaking today uh, with us about high performance teams. He has a huge body of work around this. Um, so he's going to get right into it. So let's get into some logistics really quickly. Um, so he can take the show away. Um, everyone, your microphones will be muted throughout, but do put your questions into the Q&A. Um, Rich actually is cool with taking them um, so we can have more of a conversation during um, our time together during this hour. Also, um, there are some exercises, I think, Rich, so that'll be really fun. Um, and you know, hit him with your questions. He can take it. He's, he's, from, he's used to this. All right, so other things is who's scrum.org? So scrum.org is um, created by Ken Schwaber, the one of the co-creators of the Scrum framework. Um, he created scrum.org a really long time ago. I think it's 2009. And we're a mission-based organization helping people and teams solve complex problems. We have a global community, um, over 350 people who are professional scrum trainers around the world, um, focusing on thought leadership, training, communication, community, and validation of education. So that is about it. I can't wait to get into this content. I am personally very, very curious. All right, Rich, tell them who you are. Hi, <laughs> hey, I'm Richard Kaspersky. Hey, thanks, Patricia. Really nice seeing you. Today we're going to do this session, it's about high performance teams. It's about how to get your own high performance teams. It's about a body of knowledge called the, called the core protocols. It's about psychological safety and emotional intelligence. You'll hear me say short words like psych safety and EI instead of the long words, psychological safety and emotional intelligence. I'm Richard Kasparowski. I run a program called Certified Agile Team Building. We, I, I have a bunch of classes that, that I teach as part of that program. I teach some courses at Harvard and at Boston University related to Agile and building software and working with teams and innovating. And I've got a whole bunch of ways you can get in touch with me. Definitely get in touch with me. People who are here live, you can ask questions right now. People who are watching this recorded, you can get in touch with me through any of these means later on. For people who are here live, we're going to do some live interactions. And uh, we're going to use Menti a lot for these live interactions. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're watching this webinar on a computer right now. Maybe you have a, a web browser in your pocket. Mine, mine kind of looks like this. If you have a web browser in your pocket, you could aim its camera at that QR code. And you could join us in Menti. If you want to use your bigger web browser, you could do that too. Type menti.com and then enter that code. 2252-6844. Look what everybody's doing. Do what they're doing. When you get there, tap one of those icons. You get bonus points if you can identify by name what each one of those icons is. Nobody's sure what the bottom right corner icon is. I'll pause for a minute so more people can join us. And menti.com and the, the numeric code will be there whenever we do interactions. If you haven't joined yet, don't worry, you will have a chance to. So this is about teams. This is about how to have the best team of your life on purpose, not just hope you get there by accident. I want you to do this right now. Join me in this solo, quiet thinking activity. What's the best team you were ever a member of in your entire life? We want you to identify that team. And, and when we say team here, what we mean is any group of two or more people aligned with a shared goal. That's a definition of a team. So any group of two or more people aligned with a shared goal. This could be a work team, like the work team you're on right now or some work team from your past. It could be a school project team. It could be a music group, a sports team. Uh, somebody told me their, their singing group is their best team ever with all the obvious metaphors that go along with being in harmony and all that stuff. Somebody told me their Saturday morning fishing group is their best team of their life. Whatever it is for you, hold on to that team in, in, your, in your brain right now. 
Now, I'm going to invite you to join me in what's basically a, a short guided meditation about that best team ever. All right, and everybody has cameras off who's here live. If you're watching this recorded, well, we can't see you anyway. Close your eyes right now. I invite you to close your eyes. Nobody can see you, so it's totally safe to close your eyes. It looks like this. And envision that best team of your life right now. Who are those people? Look at their faces. See them in your mind's eye. Notice every detail about the way they look. Notice the color of their eyes. And then bring in your other senses. What does it sound like when you're together with that group doing your, your activity, whatever that activity is? Are you inside? Do you hear the, the heater or the air conditioner maybe, or the, somebody's voice? Ooh, maybe somebody's voice, maybe some laughter. Are you outside? Do you hear the wind, maybe the leaves, maybe a dog barking? What other senses could we bring in? How about touch? What does it feel like? What do you feel on your skin? Is it warm? Is it cold? Do you feel the air moving? What can you sense with your nose? Is there a scent in the air? Is there any taste? Is there any food involved? Now, start to redo the activity, whatever, whatever it was that you did together with that group. Do it together right now in your mind's eye. And notice what it feels like within your body as you're doing that activity together, as you're recreating that activity right now. And feel what it feels like within you as you do that activity. What does it feel like, I don't know, in your belly, around your diaphragm? Do you feel anything anywhere in your body right now as you're doing that activity together? And what's, what's, if you could summarize that sensation, whatever that sensation is, of that best team of your life, if you could summarize that sensation in one word, what would that one word be? What's the one word that describes the sensation of the best team of your life? If you're here with us live, Share that one word with us. This is sort of like a histogram. Well, this is very much a histogram. If multiple people shared the same word, if they felt that same sensation, then it's bigger than the other words. We're a unique group of people here. So we have a unique set of words that I've never seen before, but there's some words here that I've seen. I've, I've done this a lot with a lot of different people. There's some words that come up time after time trust best team of my life it felt like trust it was fun we felt connected connection it's collaborative comfortable there's harmony there's joy there's flow it's easy there's friendship all of these words this is what it feels like qualitatively to be on a great team we all know this sensation. We all know what it feels like to be on a great team. I've been on some really great teams, and I've been on some not-so-great teams as well. I'm a, I'm a normal human just like everybody else. When I look back at my best teams, this is what it was like. And how we got there, it's sort of a mystery. We, we knew a few things. We tried a little bit of XP, literally. We tried a little bit of Scrum, literally. These are some things we tried. We knew a little bit, but we didn't know 
a whole lot about how to get a great team on purpose. So it was just good luck, the right people at the right time doing the right things together. And ever since, I've kind of been on a quest to figure out how to get the best team of my life again on purpose. And so that, that's what this session is about. It's, it's about some of, some of the learning I've done and some of the things that, that I'd like to share with you so you could get the best team of your life again on purpose. So I'm going to share a little bit of science and research, some of the, some of the evidence, the empirical evidence about, about great teams, and, and, and share some activities, share some habits that we could build together to have great teams on purpose. Oh, and, you know, we all have human dynamics issues on our teams. This, that, this session that we're doing right now, this is, this is a how-to guide to help you surmount those challenges to have great teams building awesome products on purpose all the time and to do it really quickly. So we'll start with the science and research, the evidence. The story about the, the evidence for high-performing teams is easy to tell since about six years ago. Uh, this became kind of like, uh, I don't know, common knowledge, almost cliche in, in the work we do with teams and, and, and Agile and Scrum. In the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Charles Duhigg published this article about Google and Google's work trying to figure out what it was about the best teams at Google that made them the best teams at Google. Now, they have a lot of good teams there. And yet some teams really stand out as being the best of the best. And they wanted to know what it was about those teams that made them so good so that they could get more of that with the rest of their teams. They looked at the literature on teams and team performance. This literature goes back probably 60 years. And in that literature, people have identified hundreds of different characteristics that correlate to having high-performing teams. Hundreds. Now, you've heard of probably a, a team retrospective, you know, really good, really good habit for a team retrospective, really good idea for a team retrospective is come up with one thing that you could focus on so your team would be better in the next sprint. Hundreds of things is way too many, and, and there's actually research about this. If you have more than two or three things to think about to, to improve yourself or your team, you're not going to do any of them. It's just too much. So at Google, they got a couple hundred teams to volunteer to participate in reproducing the research. They measured these teams on various attributes from the literature and on their performance. And what they found was that for these teams at Google, there was one thing that mattered more than anything else. The highest performing teams at Google, they measured high in performance. They also measured high in this thing called psychological safety. Psych safety is this idea that we feel safe together when we're doing our work together as a team. When we're together, we feel safe. We can take risks. And what does it mean to take risks? It means you can try out something new that you're not already good at. You don't, you don't feel embarrassed learning a new skill in front of your teammates, with your teammates. It's totally okay. We, you can try out new things. You can admit you don't know something. You can ask for help. You can admit you made a mistake. And you can learn from these mistakes. And this is why teams that measure high on psych safety measure high in performance. This has been reproduced. This, this research on psych safety actually started in healthcare teams. And I had this new dentist. To, uh, the part of Boston where I live, there's a, there's a really high population den density of dentists. And then I'm seeing this new dentist, and I was telling her what I did for work. Well, she had all the tools in my mouth, and she has a special skill. She, she understands what people are saying when all the dental tools are in their mouths. She ran back to her office. She got the print edition of, of her dental office magazine. And, and one, of the, one of the important articles in it was all about psych safety amongst the dental office employees and how that makes your, your practice better, makes your team better. Right, so this psych safety st stuff, there's, there's tons of evidence about it. It's been reproduced over and over and over. It's the truth. Now, the thing about it is you can't just tell, tell people, be more safe. Do more psych safety. We want you to be higher performing, so do more psych safety. It's not something you can do. It's, it's an outcome from various things that you do. Uh, and so the, the research part of this is, is it, it just kind of ends there. Now, continuing my quest, I, I made a new friend, Steve Wolf. 
Uh, he did his research at the same time as Ed Edmondson and uh, the psych safety folks were doing their research in the mid 1990s with his research partner Vanessa Druskett. Steve taught me about this broader thing called team emotional intelligence. And psych safety is a subset of team emotional intelligence. Team EI includes psych safety. It includes what we think of uh, in general as emotional intelligence, that as a group, we understand how we're doing and, and how things work within our group. We understand how to, how to behave appropriately, how to do the right thing so that our group is successful. We understand our group from an internal perspective. And we understand what's going on outside of our group as well. So we understand how the, how the system works, the processes work outside of our group. We understand how people are feeling outside of our team. We understand how to influence people to adjust their behaviors so that they help our team succeed and they help the broader organization succeed. Team EI includes things like social capital, investing in relationships with people and, and reaping the rewards of those relationships, reaping the rewards of those investments executive support, and it kind of becomes obvious why teams, and this is in the literature, there's loads of evidence about this, teams that measure high on team EI measure high in performance. Their executives give them all the support they need. They remove all the obstacles, they give them all the resources they need. So these teams are successful. And the research again ends right around there. You can't just tell people do more team EI because we want you to be more successful. It's, it's an outcome, it's not just a thing you tell people to do. Third body of work is the stuff called the core protocols. This is the work of Jim McCarthy and Michelle McCarthy. They had this experience of a really successful team. All those feelings and sensations we identified earlier, they experienced all of that. And they realized they, they kind of just got lucky. They did a few things on purpose, but they weren't really sure what it was that made that group so successful. They opened a team research lab, and in their lab, they would give people, they would invite a group of people to come in, a, a team, give them an assignment and a deadline, five days. Get this assignment done. It was observational research. They would just watch teams at work on this assignment and take notes and notice which teams succeeded and which teams weren't so successful. As they were watching teams come through their lab, working on that assignment, they noticed that there were common behaviors of the successful teams, that the, the higher performing teams did a lot of things that were, had a lot of behaviors that were similar to each other. And the McCarthy's hypothesized that maybe they could share these behavior patterns with other teams, and maybe other teams could build habits out of these behaviors. And maybe having built those habits, any team could also be that successful. So they wrote down these behaviors, they, they wrote, wrote them down as little scripts. And they, they called their pattern language protocols, right? So they use this word protocol. A lot of us know the word protocol from computers talking to each other. Like there's the web protocol, HTTP, the P at the end is the word protocol. Protocols existed long before there were computers. There are, for example, healthcare protocols. When a patient comes in, there's a list of steps that everybody does everywhere in the world to take care of a new patient. There are diplomatic protocols. There are ways to make sure that representatives of different countries communicate clearly with each other and achieve their goals together. And these things that they called the core protocols, they're really team success protocols. There are ways for us to behave together to make sure there's very little miscommunication and to achieve our shared goals. The McCarthy's switched the style of their lab work to be experimental research. They introduced this new variable, give people these protocols for successful teams. So the same thing happened as, as before. They would invite a group of people in, a team, give them an assignment and a deadline, five days. And the variable was they gave them these behavior patterns. And every time they did that in their lab, the teams were successful. They were super creative. They finished by, by the five-day deadline. They were high-performing teams. They reproduced this with teams in the wild, real teams working on real products in industry. And other people took this work and, and, and 
have done the same, reproduced this with real teams in the industry. But McCarthy's made this work, the core protocol is available for free uh, to, to make sure that it was available for everybody to use so that all teams could, could try these out. Oh, and, and Steve Wolf, the team EI researcher, along with Vanessa Dreskett, I shared these ideas with Steve Wolf. As we reviewed them and reflected on them, on them together, we noticed that for everything that gets measured, every aspect of emotional intelligence that there is a measurement for, there's the corresponding behavior in the core protocols that helps make it happen. There's a corresponding behavior that helps you raise individual and group emotional intelligence, that helps you raise safety and so on. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt the, 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 the information, but there's a really interesting question and I, I'm wondering if you might get into to it later. So um, one thing that we're just wondering from the group is that um, when you're talking about psychological safety and we're thinking about the team as a unit, mm -hmm. Does that make psychological safety something that's binary? Is it an all or nothing oh. proposition? So if there is someone <laughs> who is um, not feeling safe, does yeah. that does that mean that the whole team is unsafe? Yeah, that's such a, that's such a great question. Uh, it's not exactly binary. It's not like the lights are on or the lights are off. It, it might be more like a dimmer switch. Now, there, there are measurement instruments for all of this stuff. There, there are ways to measure it, and they're valid and reliable, uh, which means they, they actually measure safety, and they measure it the same way every time. Like every time I step on a scale, it measures my weight the right way. When we measure psych safety, we're usually measuring it by surveying all of the members of a team. And there's, I think there's really just like three questions that people have come down to in the research. Uh, that we could find. I could share them later. Mm -hmm. What we find is that there, there's there's two ways to do it. One is to take the, the the mean or the average of the measurements of all the individuals. And if it's, you know, the high end, we could say the team as a whole feels safe. What we're also looking for is the range of answers. So yeah, like like you like you asked, if if one person on the team feels unsafe or behaves unsafely so we could talk about unsafely, violent yeah. be not physical but the aggressive sure. behavior versus yeah. nonviolent behavior if there was one person on the team engaged in behavior like that it's very likely that the team's measurement would be unsafe that that the rest of the team members would not feel safe with that person around mm -hmm. yeah and so we could do things about that and what we're what we're going to get into as we, as we go along here is uh, habits we can build together and ideas for building that safety. Yeah, let's get to it then, because the next <laughs> right. thing I'm going to ask you is about Hawthorne effect, and then I'm going to dominate the whole conversation. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, here we go. So another way to look at this is that if you want a high performing team, and you probably do, that's, that's why you're here live or watching this recording, you definitely want psych safety, like we were just talking about. And psych safety is a subset of this broader thing, team emotional intelligence. And you can't just tell people do more psych safety or do more team. Uh, you have to have a way to build this together, behaviors to engage in, habits to build. Core protocols are one set of behaviors, one set of habits that you can build together. It will get you team AI and get you psych safety and get you high performance. Okay, so there's the science and research, the evidence, the background of all, all of this, and then really the stuff that matters. The practical skills. How, how do you do this? So there's a whole bunch of skills. I, I break them down into a set of building blocks. And the first building block is called positive bias. What I mean by positive bias is orienting ourselves, orienting our behaviors, orienting what we say to each other in a way that's aligned with the outcomes that we want. And usually what this means is we're not going to be negative on purpose. We're going to orient all of our, our affect toward positivity, toward including people, toward asking them what their ideas are, toward not negating them automatically, not saying no when somebody shares an idea or the, oh, that's a bad idea, or here's what I think is wrong with that idea, but being more yes-oriented, helping draw out more ideas from people versus shutting them down pretending that somebody's idea might be a good one and thinking about it or evaluating it, maybe doing a mental experiment, maybe doing a real experiment. 
maybe getting your own data, maybe doing work that's empirical. Here's an activity that we do as we're, as we're learning and practicing this skill with teams. And it's an activity like this. There, there are variations of it. And one version of the activity is to make a plan for lunch tomorrow or make a plan for lunch today with a partner. Try this out later on. You're not going to be able to do it right now during the webinar. If you're watching the recording, maybe you're watching with a friend. And you can do this with that friend right now. And the idea is actually try to make a plan for lunch or, or dinner or whatever it is that, you, that you're interested in. The first version of the activity is to always respond to your partner, starting with the words, yes, but. All right, so it might go like this. It'd be like, hey, partner, want to have lunch later today? And the partner would say, yes, but uh, we're not in the same city. We're, we're working together in, in virtual space, so I don't know how we could possibly have lunch together. And you're like, yes, but there's this amazing invention called video meetings and Zoom and this stuff, and we could do it over Zoom. That'd be fun. And like, yes, but we're in different time zones. We can't possibly eat lunch at the same time because of that. And like, yes, but I could I could adjust my lunch time maybe here my time zone. Yes, but blah blah blah. Yes, but blah, blah, blah. In the activity, you're always starting with yes, but as you respond to your partner. Most people, as they do this, notice that yes, but is kind of like a disguise for saying no. And it's hard to, hard to make a plan when you're saying yes, but to each other. It's sort of like putting a wall between each other. It's kind of like disconnecting. And then we do a second iteration of it, yes, and. The same goal, except we always respond starting with yes and, like, hey, partner, how about we can get lunch later today? And the partner says, yes, and. Even though we're in different cities, we could use this amazing invention called video meetings and respond with yes and. Yes, and even though we're in different time zones, I'd be happy to adjust my lunch time. Yes, and, you know, and then new ideas just come. Yes, and maybe we could uh, even order out and get the same food delivered and, and it would be like we're really eating lunch together like, yes and blah 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 yes and blah 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 what people notice in the second version of the activity typically is that they're actually saying yes to each other they feel more creative they're even laughing it feels good within them they're coming up with ideas they're coming up with ideas that are bigger and better and more creative than either of them would have thought of individually. And, and this activity is, is mostly just to reflect upon, to experience what positive bias feels like. And to, to point out that this positive affect, getting this positive affect, getting more positive bias in our teams could be as easy as just noticing some of the words we're using. Avoiding no in general. Avoiding but. Like really being careful about the wording we're using, about the, the affect, our tone of voice, our word choice, our facial expressions. Everything that we do together matters as teammates. And that's the building block of high-performing teams, that idea of positive bias. We go on from there to freedom or autonomy. We notice empirically by watching high-performing teams that the people on the teams have freedom. They have the ability to opt out. They have the ability to opt in. On the best teams, people choose which team they're on. They choose the work they're doing. They choose how they're doing the work. Some of those phrases sound a lot like scrum. We choose what work we're doing and we choose how to do the work. There's, there's a lot of this freedom built into Scrum. And no matter how you're working together, we've got a couple of behaviors here, these protocols. And you can check out these protocols. The short URLs will take you there. Pass is the idea that on the best teams, people get to choose about opting out or opting in on any activity the team is doing. And it's totally okay to do so. You just say, I pass. If this is one of your team agreements, one of your team habits, then everybody in the team knows what you mean when you're saying, when you say, I pass. And it's okay. Nobody hassles you about it. Nobody judges you for passing. It builds safety. 
that you can opt out of anything at any time. That whatever you're doing with your team, you're opting into it. And checkout is sort of like pass, but even more. It's anytime you can't be fully engaged with your team or it doesn't feel right to be together, you, you can leave the team temporarily. That's called checking out. Um, ooh. You ever been doing any work with your team and, and people are actually doing something else at the same time? Okay, so what we notice on the, the best of the best teams is that when we're working together, that's all we're doing. We're working together. We're all in with each other and the work we're doing. On mediocre teams, maybe on, we call them average or normal teams, people aren't necessarily totally in. They're doing something else simultaneously. There's, there's kind of like friction on the team's performance because we're not totally engaged in, in, in the work we're doing with each other. On the best of the best teams, we're totally engaged with the work we're doing. We're not doing anything else. Checkout is a way to make sure that the people who are there in, in the space, physical space or digital space, are totally in, totally engaged on the work. Also, it's totally okay to check out. If you need to go do something else, talk to a customer, solve a production issue, just go do it. Um. And Rich, the, rest, the rest of us will be able to, to focus and be creative and, and do the important work together right now. And yes, Patricia. <laughs> I love that because it's, it's, it's talking about working toward the goal and being committed to each other to make goals happen, right? And so that's yeah. very, that's a big focus for us um, when we're thinking about um, something like Scrum. So when you're talking about things like, you know, I, I can pass, I can check out, yeah. there's is that saying that, hey, you know what? We recognize that on the team, we're not all going to be able to dedicate 100% of the time. And is that is that at all correlated with this notion of safety? Is that is that, hey, we're going to guarantee that this environment is always going to be 100%? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The, and the, way, the way it relates to safety is that it's safe to opt out of anything anytime, right? So everything is by your own choice. Mm -hmm. On teams that, that incorporate these behaviors or these habits, anything that you're doing with your team is because you want to, because you're choosing to, not because anybody is coercing you to do something or, or forcing you to do something or, or implying that if you don't do it, you'll get fired or whatever. That, that's, that, those are recipes for Oh, low, you just teed it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things is that, that I'm understanding is that you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to say right, not right now. I can, yeah. I don't, I don't feel ashamed when I'm doing that. How does that work when we talk about, or when we're thinking about our relationship and you, you kind of mentioned this before with um, management and with, mm -hmm. Um, with if we're in an IT organization that's working with a business organization, how does yeah. how does that look? Because that support is sometimes uh, not always there and conflicting also. Yeah. So another great question. In the best organizations, the highest performing organizations, the leaders are a high performing team. Right. And, and how do the leaders become a high-performing team? Well, they have a sense of high safety together as leaders, and they have, a, they have a high group emotional intelligence together as a group of leaders. The, the evidence is that on any kind of team doing any kind of work, well, creative work at least, uh, creative problem-solving work like the work we do in, in, in IT and, and building products, the leadership team is an important team. And the leaders can learn and practice these skills as well. Uh, learn and practice skills that build safety for themselves and, and high group emotional intelligence for themselves. When the leaders have a team like that, they're modeling for all the other teams in the organization. And they're making it possible and safe for everybody else in the organization to experience these same sensations of safety and, and, and high team EI. And, and, and According to the research, and I think this bears out in most people's experiences, the success of any individual or any team is, is we could say, constrained by the performance of their leaders. 
if you want to have great teams, you, you, act, you also have to have great leaders and great leadership teams. So start with leaders is, is one really good way to make sure this happens and, it, and that it can happen for you and your team. Awesome. There's a lot of um, follow-up questions. <laughs> that's it's true. always that <laughs> that um, that conflict around, um, and it, and it, and I think it's 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 coming down to the culture that you're talking about that may not be expressed right here in terms yeah. of you don't have the freedom to choose. We're not working toward the the same thing. There's there's conflict here naturally. Yeah, that, that word culture is really important. Uh, there's sort of a, a default culture mm -hmm. in most groups of people, most organizations. It's whatever the whatever the incumbent culture was when you joined the team or the company. That's the culture. Yeah. By definition, most teams and most companies are average, right? They're they're just using whatever 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 norms happened to have happened. What we're talking about here is intentional culture. The best teams are not normal. They're not doing things that, that we would consider normal. It's kind of not normal to just opt out of anything, anytime with your teammates. That, that's not normal. But average teams are what's normal. We're talking about teams that are better than average, teams that are different. This is, this is kind of abnormal, but in a very positive way. On the best of the best teams, people have freedom. The, the next building block is self-awareness on the best of the best teams. The individuals know who they are, they know what they're about, they know how they're feeling, they know what's important to them. And there are a couple of, there are three documented behaviors that go, go along with this, three team agreements or habits that we could build together. There's an emotion check-in, there's asking for help, there's this idea called personal alignment. We're gonna go deeper into these right now with some solo quiet thinking activities. So try this out, fill in the blank on this sentence. I feel blank. How do you feel right now? You can use any word or words to describe to yourself how you feel right now. And you might write it down on a piece of paper. How are you feeling? Just finish off that sentence. And okay, we're doing this together with scrum.org. We love to do things iteratively. So our second iteration of this is it's multiple choice. I feel blank and fill in the blank with one or more than one of these four words, glad, sad, mad, and afraid. How do you feel right now? Which one of those words is closest to how you feel right now? And then maybe add on any other information that helps describe how you're feeling right now. What's going into it, what's happening around you, whatever it is. I know I'm curious. Let's, let's sort of get a gauge of the whole group here with us live. How are you feeling right now? Glad, sad, mad, or afraid? What's going on with you individually? What's going on with us as a group? Uh, this is totally believable because there's at least one of every one of these four primary emotions being felt amongst us as a group right now. There's a whole bunch of glad, there's some sad, there's some mad, there's some afraid. This is normal. We're a group of humans. This is a rather large group. If you did this with your team, this would be pretty simple way to start building a habit of more personal emotional intelligence, which means you know how you're feeling and you can, you can articulate it. 
and some group emotional intelligence. We're starting to share with each other how we're feeling. This is an element of both psychological safety and team emotional intelligence. Just having a habit like this. Oh, and here's, here's another way you can do it. This is the protocol for the emotion check-in. It's done with two or more people. When it's your turn, you say out loud, I feel glad, sad, mad, or afraid, just like we practiced in the solo quiet thinking version of this. You could add more explanation. You could repeat steps one and two as many times as you want. You have freedom. You could pass. You don't have to do this. You, you let your partners know, you let your teammates know that you're done by saying, I'm in. They let you know that they heard you by saying, welcome. And then somebody else takes a turn. Here's an example. I feel glad. Everything's going well this morning as, as, we, as we produce this webinar. I have a nice cup of coffee with me. Uh, all, the, all the tech is working. I took a walk with my wife and the dog. I had a nice breakfast. It, it's a, oh, the weather's nice. It's a nice morning. Uh, and then I, I, I often iterate through the, the, the four primary emotion words here. I, I'm sad. Am I sad about anything? Uh, I suddenly feel sad that I don't, I don't see my son often enough. He's, uh, he's a 28-year-old adult. He lives not that far away. We've been seeing each other uh, over video a lot lately, but not in physical space, and I miss him. I guess I saw him a couple weeks ago in physical space, and that was really nice. I, I want to do more of that. Mad. Am I mad about anything? I don't think so. Afraid. I'm always afraid some, some technology stuff is going to go bad. I think I, I think I froze for a moment because uh, something appeared on my screen that said my internet connection was unstable. It kind of made my brain unstable at the moment. Uh, I'm in. And then when I say I'm in, everybody who's here with me would say welcome. You can, you can try right now if you're here with me live. Say welcome. And then somebody else would take their turn, right? A really easy way to make this a habit is to add it as information in your daily scrum. And there are a lot of teams that do this, right? The purpose of the daily scrum is to gauge our progress on our sprint goal, share information with each other, ask for help from each other. How are we feeling right now is, is really great information about what's going on with us as a group. Uh, how we're feeling together, whether you know, somebody's going to be a little bit challenged today or, or people are going to have all their superpowers available to them. It helps build, it's a habit that helps build safety together. You know, sharing how we're feeling, this is not normal. On average teams, we don't share how we're feeling. Somebody says, hey, how are you? And the default answer is good. You're not allowed to say anything else. <laughs> Unless you're in sales or something and you're allowed to say, I'm mad. I'm mad. <laughs> I'm, I'm mad at those software people. They, they, they're missing the deadline again and blah, 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 blah. You're allowed to be mad if you're, if you're in sales. And they didn't build exactly <laughs> yeah. what we sold. Um, not they didn't to say build that exactly I... what was in the spec. <laughs> I... and then you're allowed to be mad. But, and, and, and so that, that's, that's sort of like default culture. That's normal teams. That's average teams. On the best teams, people share how they're really feeling. And it's not, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. It's whatever it is you're really feeling. It's, it, it's being more vulnerable. It's building a higher sense of safety together that you can say how you're really feeling. And it's okay mm -hmm. to share that with everybody. I loved um, your suggestion of trying to incorporate this into the daily scrum as mm -hmm. something to test. And at first it might feel awkward yeah. But the point of the daily scrum is really, hey, let's make sure that we, we, we talk and we make sure things are, are um, progressing because of the impediments that we might be facing but not really talking about and the dependencies we have might, that, that we're facing. So there's a lot yeah. about not just like, you know, we're, we're, we're interested in how each other are as human beings and that obviously affects our work. So one of the other things that we look at in Scrum, and so you've, you've talked about the ability to pass. And so if we were to go to the other spectrum and say, what happens if, and I'm just imagining this, if everybody passes, 
what would that that mean? I mean, that's a big sign. If we were, <laughs> yeah. and in a circumstance, you see this a lot, right? When we come into a sprint and people aren't showing up, let's say for a refinement, we're going to talk about how to break down the work so that we can get to the sprint planning, you know, things will be a little bit easier. We get to sprint planning, the people who didn't show up, they start showing up and yep. they now have a lot of, you know, things to say about what could have been done, what can't be done, and other people start to pass. Well, how would you, how yeah. would you approach that situation where you're talking about trying to build some psychological safety? Yeah, the way you said, said it, it's, it's really interesting information when a lot of people are passing a lot of the time. Or even if one person is passing a lot of the time, that's really interesting information. What's, what's happening? You know, in, 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 in sort of just scrummy jargon, that, that's really good information to bring to a retrospective at the end of the sprint. Uh, just, just more data about the team and how can we make the team better. In, in this core protocols kind of jargon, uh, we've got some, some additional behaviors we could add on here. I mean, one thing, so, so first of all, when, when people pass, it's totally okay. You just let them do it. You don't challenge them about it. You don't ask them about it because then it would stop being safe for people to pass. Now, later on, you could, you could share how you're feeling. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sad or mad. It seems like every time we, we try to get to work on something, uh, this, is what I'm, this is what I'm noticing and that's how I'm feeling about it. We've got some other behaviors that we could add on, uh, like investigate and intention check, and we'll describe those soon. Uh, we've got decision-making protocols and conflict resolution protocols. It turns out that on the highest performing teams, we have a way that we all understand to make decisions together and a way to resolve conflict together. Now, what if when we're making that sprint plan, we have a way of knowing that we're actually truly all in on it and we actually truly all support it before we say we're done making our sprint plan? And then we hold ourselves accountable to that plan that we totally voluntarily made together. And then we're actually less likely to pass on the things as we go throughout the sprint. We've got, we've got a few more behaviors to add on to all of these. And they, they all kind of work together, supporting each other. Uh, oh, here's another one. Ooh, a solo, quiet thinking, maybe writing down your answer activity. What's the most important thing in the world to you? What do you want more than anything else? And think, think big, think really, really big. This is big like I want world peace, big like I want, I want COVID solved. You know, I, want, I want more coffee, but that's not that big. I can just get more coffee. What do you want? What's the biggest, most important thing in the world to you? I'll go back to this later. I'm, I'm really just introducing this right now. Or if you're watching the recording, pause the recording, give yourself as much time as you need. Think about this question, what's blocking you from what you want? If, if you answered the first one fully, truthfully, honestly, you should have all of that already. The biggest, most important thing in the world to you, you, you could be aligning all of your energy and behavior toward that. You sh that's all you should be doing. Why aren't you doing that? What's in your way? Go back to this question later or, or pause the recording right now and think about that. And then second iteration, fill in the blank again, and this time it's multiple choice. Fill in the blank with one of these virtues or superpowers. Which one of these virtues or superpowers, if, if it was present within you, if it really was your, your superpower, it would eliminate everything that's in your way and get you everything you want. Uh, you get to define what these words mean for you. And if you're not sure which one you want, the default answer with the asterisk next to it is self-awareness. If you're not sure what you want, you might want self-awareness. We're going to call that your personal alignment, whatever, whatever you put there, that sentence, I want self-awareness or I want courage or I want self-care. That's your personal alignment. You could also give yourself a way to practice this, to build this as your real superpower. How would you practice it every day? How could you practice peace every day? How could you practice fun or wisdom every day? What would that practice look like? How would people know you're practicing it? How could you ask others for help as you practice it? This is, this is high level 
high level self awareness. This is this is high level. Individuals on a team know what they want. Hey, if if you were going to pick one of these words, which would which word would it be for you? What would your future superpower be? So in our group, we're going for every one of these. Imagine if we could work together or create something together. If we, as a group, had these as our superpowers, that would be awesome. When we do this with real teams, we share this information with each other and we ask each other for help building these skills. This is sort of like primary goal. As individuals and as our team, we're going to do this with each other. The product that we're going to build is, is going to reflect how great we are as a team. The, the greatness of the product is going to exactly correspond to the greatness of us as, as teammates. And so if we work on being great teammates, being a great team first, we're going to have a great product as a side effect almost. And then we think about what's our product goal, what are our short-term goals, what are our sprint goals, what are our daily goals, and so on from there. We add on a fourth building block, connection. We're oriented toward posit positivity, we have freedom and autonomy, we have high self-awareness, and then we connect with each other. The, the well, check-in, we're, we're connecting with each other when we do the check-in, so it's also a connection protocol. When we ask for help, we're asking for help from somebody else. Personal alignment, we share it with each other. Intention check, an investigator, the new ones here. Intention check is about assuming that people are doing their best and asking them about it when, when things seem to go off track. Investigate is about asking open questions and trying to learn more about our teammates as quickly as possible. Now, what we notice as we do these activities, as we build these habits together, is that it's kind of like, uh, if we've built these habits, if we just try these behaviors, it's kind of like a reproducible recipe for something that I call love. That we're just connecting with each other. And that's, that's love. If, if love is too unusual for you and your team, you can call it friendship. And, and what I mean by this is this, this recipe. This is the recipe for friendship. Think about the best relationship you've ever had, and a team is a special kind of relationship. We start with positive bias. We want to do something good together. We're getting together to do something positive. We have freedom in our best relationships and best teams. We do it because we want to. We share how we're feeling with each other, that emotions check in, and they share with us, and, and nobody judges us for how we're feeling. In fact, we want to hear more. Personal alignment. We share with each other what's the most important thing in the world to us. And we investigate. We try to know each other as deeply as possible, as quickly as possible. This is a reproducible recipe for friendship. It's a reproducible recipe for love. It's a reproducible recipe for a great team. And if that's too weird for you, I mean, I, I grew up in Massachusetts. I, I think that's kind of weird. Well, you can just think of it as a script to follow a program to run in your brain or in the brains of the people on your team. And it totally works. It's totally reproducible. We would add on, now in work context, we'd, we'd, we'd add on more work-oriented kinds of behaviors, a way to make decisions, a way to resolve conflict, a great way to give and receive feedback. And then finally, we'd add on a way to keep each other accountable to stay on the rails. Things go wrong. How do, we, how do we stay on track when things go wrong? On the best of the best teams, we have a way. It's totally safe to tell each other that we made an agreement and we messed up on that agreement. What could we do differently so we're a better team? And that's what they call protocol check here. So, you know, what will you do? How could you, how could you incorporate these behaviors into, into your life, into your team, if you wanted to do this with your team, if you wanted a team that was not average, if you wanted a team that was better than average, what could you do to make things different and better in your team? And what's your, as you reflect on everything we did here, 
in this in this hour. What what's your key takeaway? What's the most important thing you heard or learned? The most interesting thing you heard or learned? And if it's something else, I'd love to hear what it was after after we're done. So we've got a lot of people noticing that friendship is totally congruent with having a high-performing team. If you watch the best of the best teams, you'll notice that they appear to be friends. How about that? That core protocol, that's a nice set of practices to raise team EII. And team EI is a way to raise psych safety. And all of those are ways, ways to have high-performing teams. That there is actually science and research. There is a lot of evidence about what goes on in the best of the best teams and we can we can harness and use that that evidence to make our teams better to make our lives better uh some key takeaways if you want a high performing team you definitely want psych safety you definitely want team ei and you need a way to do that core protocols are a set of behaviors habits you could build team agreements you could make to help you get there uh and they can help you solve your team dynamics problems Right, so how can you get this for your teams? Uh, you can get in touch with me. You can visit my website. You can ask me for help anytime. You can check out my books. You could look at thecorpprotocols.org. All of the stuff is totally free. You could sign up for one of my classes. You could join me every week. I do a free office hour on Wednesdays. Uh, once a month, we do an Agile Dojo where we learn and practice skills. Uh, build agile skills together you can join us at the next agile dojo uh, you can sign up for one of the public classes you could book a private class for your group again that list of classes and um, you know one of the things that that we love about scrum working in an agile way is we we get we gather evidence and we use that to make things better i love feedback will you help me well, this is a this is another activity. Perfection game is one of these protocols. Will you use perfection game to give me feedback on what we just did right now? If you're here live with us, if you're watching the recording, you can practice this too. It's three questions. The first question is: Give this session a score from one to ten. Where ten would be, it's just perfect. Third, second question is: Tell me what was good about it so that we could do more of that. We could amplify that goodness. The third question is, what could we do differently to make this a perfect 10? Now, this, this perfection game, this way of giving feedback, we use this in teams as well as for, for anything that people are creating. I use this when I want feedback on anything I've created, any idea that I have. I also use it as a way to do retrospectives with teams. Every person on the team individually, hey, give, give our team a score from one to 10 for the work we did during, during this sprint that's ending right now. Hey, everybody on the team, tell us what we did really well so we could do more of that, we could amplify that in the, in the sprint that we're about to start. And hey, everybody on the team, what opportunities to make things better do we have? How could we make things better and be the best team that ever existed in the coming sprint? This is a, a great way to do a retrospective. Use Perfection Game to give ourselves feedback. And it, again, it's positively oriented feedback. There's nothing here about anybody's bad, anybody's wrong. Everything here is what did we do that was good? And, and what else could we do to have even more goodness on our team? So that's Perfection Game. Thanks for joining me in that activity. It's good to get a little practice on these things, build them up as habits. That's it for this session, this webinar. Thanks so much for joining me, for joining us. Uh, I invite you to stay in touch with me. If we have time, we'll do a couple more questions. <laughs> Patricia. Uh, as promised we do not have enough time <laughs> but um what we do thank you everybody for attending um these slides this information and this recording will be up what i loved if you have time go back through this with by yourself with his um 
with your team, there are a lot of practices that Rich went through that we tried that are techniques for um, trying to um, improve psychological safety, core protocols, practice those with your team. So we have a lot of different um, resources also on the scrum.org website that, that Rich is showing here, but um, thank you everyone for participating. We have tons of questions that Rich and I will look at um, responding to um, after this webinar. So thank you, Scrum on, thank you, Rich. Have a great day. Thanks everybody, bye.